I'm Casey Finey, host of Creative Control. I'm Kate Davis, host of The New Way We Work. I'm Amelia Hemphill, host of World Changing Ideas. And you're listening to Fast Company's 2022 in Review, a special end of the year episode with each of our podcast hosts. All right. So today we're going to talk about some of the biggest stories of the year from Fast Company, highlights from each of our podcasts, and some New Year's resolutions because, of course. But first, I want to start by asking everyone, how was your 2022? Amelia, as the newest member of our team, let's start with you. What, how was your 2022? Oh, thanks, Casey. Yeah, it's been really good. I think really? the big words, <laughs> it's been busy. It's been super okay. busy. I feel like 2022 in England, the year COVID got cancelled. So everyone's been making up for lost time, you know, cramming in as much as possible. So it's been super busy. Um, but no, mine's been pretty inspiring, you know, hearing from all these people trying to change the world. It, yeah, it makes you feel good. A half glass full approach. I love it. Kate, what about you? How's your 2022 been? So I wonder if we're going to be like a slow downward sl- slide. I've, <laughs> with I me, have, just rock bottom. With yep, you, because I, I, I know what's coming with you. But I, <laughs> I will say my line that I thought of uh, uh, was as best as can be expected. I think that mm. it's, you know, I'm not maybe as as optimistic as Amelia. Um, I love that that sunny attitude. But, um, you know, all things considered, it was a it was a big news year as we'll get into it was a lot of horrible depressing news as per usual but you know personally i think we are on the upswing so as best as can be expected i think there are a lot of hopeful things on the horizon too mm. yeah sure that's so, great so, i love that so casey how was your 2022 <laughs> tragic <laughs> i don't want to be that presence in the room but this really has been a lot has been going on, and I feel like I am doing my best to maintain that optimism, to keep going. But I have learned to have a very healthy distance from the news cycle. I take in what I need to take in to stay abreast of the situations, but I am very quick to not do any deep dives. I'm not going to get into any think pieces or any real like just I, I can't do it I can't do it I, I'm at the point where I just really need to have and that's weird to say as a journalist but I feel like it's even more important for me to have a distance from the news cycle so I am surviving um <laughs> and oh. this year has been a lot it has been a lot and I feel like it's been a year that I feel like we are in a perma crisis, which is one of the words that was, I think, shortlisted for the word of the year. The word of the year was actually goblin mode. And Kate, you like you highlighted this story, yeah. so I want you to sort of tell goblin us a mode. little bit about this. There's a couple different outlets that put out their word of the year. I think like Miriam Webster does one, Washington Post did one. I think there's a couple different ones. So, um, and it was funny. I looked back at the word of the year for the last decade, and it really kind of. Uh, highlights like, oh yeah, that's what was happening that year. Like the the year of Me Too, I think it you know was was something to do with sexual harassment. Yeah, this year the the couple words that have been floated are Goblin Mode, Gaslighting, and Perma Crisis. And so, what is Goblin Mode? See, I didn't know. I had to look it up, which shows Sounds like, like a good name for a band. Yes, Go, right? it's like how how out of touch <laughs> I am. Um, but I think Goblin Mode is like where you just kind of give up and just like feel like consuming a bunch of junk food and like laying around to like binge watching things and like you're just like blah. You're in like Goblin Mode. It's a slang term that describes. A type of behavior which is unapologetically self-indulgent, lazy, slovenly, or greedy, typically in a way that rejects social norms or expectations. Now, whom's tier among us (laughs) has been in goblin mode in 2022? I love that journey for us. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's like, I mean, I guess uh, that along with uh, permacrisis really go hand in hand, right? It's like you, it's all become too much and you just give up. I mean, maybe it's a little bit hand in hand with the topic that I talked about a lot on uh, The New Way We Work, quiet quitting, which is also kind of just like giving up, disengaging. Um, It's all, like you said, Casey, like it's all like gotten to be too much. And so some people have just gone into goblin mode. Amelia, are you in goblin mode? 
Well, I think we need some more good news, guys. World changing <laughs> ideas, you know, there's always hope out there. <laughs> but I do live most of my life in goblin mode. I think that's I think that's pretty standard, no? Why are we all pressuring ourselves to get out of goblin mode? This is true. This yeah. is true. That's part of the like return to office, right? I don't want to have to put pants on again and like leave my home. Right. No, I haven't worn jeans in years. Why would you subject yourself to that? <laughs> and that's the thing, there's been so much big 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 news highlights that have all unfortunately been mostly terrible i mean there's russians invasion of ukraine i mean elon musk doing whatever elon musk is doing over at twitter uh florida's don't say gay bill there's been so many terrible things and i'm we could we could talk about those but i'm curious to hear from everyone like what is a positive news headline from this year well that's a hard question <laughs> amelia i feel like you're our resident optimist oh guys i've got so many I can I can give you a rundown. Please. Maybe I should save those when we're talking about the podcast. This is true. But, uh, you know, there have been a lot of amazing scientific breakthroughs, you know, medical breakthroughs. We had COP27 this year. Supposedly, people are trying to do stuff about the environment. I think we need to change our echo chamber maybe onto only good news. This is true. But we are in a crisis of information, though, aren't we? It's too much. That's very true. But I have been particularly excited with the James Webb telescope images and everything that's coming out of that. Yes. That has been my saving grace in 2022 <laughs> as, a, as a as a amateur uh, science nerd and like uh, astrophysics light. Um, <laughs> I just I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to these things, but I love it so much. But it's just been my saving grace of this year. I think yeah, it's some AI art. Yeah, oh, that has that can stop. I think the amount of people <laughs> who keep uploading their photos in that AI art, that may cease. And I feel like are people reading the terms and conditions of that? Oh, like, this they is, know what this they're giving literally up? happens every year, right? Where every it's like, year. oh, there's this new meme where you upload your picture and it's like you you guys are just giving your information to, away. You know, your fate like feed facial. The AI. Yeah. 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 We swerved back into bad news. Like, <laughs> well, here, Amelia, Amelia like lobbed a really good, like, and a really we're fun like, no, nope. and we're just nope. like, and the nope. ramifications of it all. Well, nope, can't have it. And then here, oh, I'm sitting nice. here thinking, okay, what's a good thing I can say? What's a good thing I can say? And I, I don't want to. I mean, one of the biggest news stories I think of 2022 was the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And yeah. we at Fast Company, you know, I'm really proud of. We had a, a great package called the Business Case for Abortion, and we've like covered abortion access pretty regularly. And I do not want to put a positive spin on overturning Roe v. Wade. However, it has churned a lot of innovation. It has churned a lot of like power of the people. Um, in my home state of Michigan, where I am, uh, there was a ballot initiative that got the most signatures ever. They changed the, the state constitution. Like it's really kind of like these big stories like this have catalyzed cat Am I saying the wrong word? Have have made people really kind of take action, and and we've seen like the power of collective action in a big way this year. For sure, and sort of real life collective action, right? I feel like over the last few years, we've sort of just been clicktivists. You sort of mm. like something on social media and feel like you've you're a voice for change. But you know, this year we've seen people really taking to the streets, kind of coming together and actually protesting for things. It's pretty powerful. Absolutely. And, you know, in 2022, outside of the normal um, hellscape of the news cycle, I mean, we at Fast Company Podcast had a lot going on. I know, Kate, you spent the majority of the year working on Ambition Diaries, which was released in October on The New Way We Work. So tell us about this project, because it really is quite spectacular. And I'd love to also hear other highlights from the show in 2022. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Ambition Diaries is um, a project that I had been thinking about for many years, and we partnered with the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, um, which was, they were a fantastic partner. We sent out seven reporters from across the country from, you know, very diverse backgrounds, racially, class, industry, geographically. We tried to, you know, really get a representation of America, and we talked to mothers and daughters from across the country about some of the, like, really critical issues that we cover all of the time. You know, so kind of the, the news peg for this was that women's progress in the labor force was set back a generation because of COVID. Millions of women left the workforce. And 
I really wanted to understand kind of how far we've come and how far we haven't come. Um, and so in speaking, having these, these daughters uh, have these really intimate conversations, which the reporter kind of just fades to the background and you feel like you're listening in on these like revelatory, beautiful moments between mothers and daughters where they share things that they had never shared with each other before. And it really puts a human lens on, you know, things like the child care crisis, things like unpaid labor, um, sexual harassment, and discrimination in, in the workplace. Like it's, it's such a beautiful, wonderful project that came together. Um, and I, I, I can't be more proud and, and more excited of, of the work that we did in Ambition Diaries. And I think we have a, a clip. Again, I could talk about it forever. And, and it's a four part uh, series. So there's, there's lots to listen to. Um, but we have uh, one short clip from it. My mom was a feminist to a fault, but there was still also all the other old dodges of, you know, you were supposed to stay with your children's father, you know, just all of those things. And I, we weren't happy. You know, we just, we, we weren't happy. And that's not to say that we were miserable for the entire 32 years. We weren't. There were great times. But now looking back, like how many years I didn't do the things that I wanted to do. It, you've heard me talk about it so many times where I felt like I got dumped into a white room with, you know, white walls and a white floor and a white ceiling. Like everything that I knew had been taken away from me. You know, my job, my the amount of money that I had, like all of these things. And so I'm here in this white room, except there is one thing that's familiar in here and it's my marriage. I mean, as I mentioned, this is a really ambitious, amazing <laughs> project that you've done. And so I'm curious, I mean, like, as as a journalist, I mean, like, what was your biggest takeaway working on something like this? I think, you know, it's something that I've I've long believed is, like, to hear from the people experiencing the news rather than just talk about them. And I really, really loved that we got to do that and got to, because it, it, it really drives the point home. It puts a human voice on things. It puts a human lens on things. Um, and to talk to, I hate, we like, we say this a lot in journalism, like real people, but you know, like <laughs> real people who are living these things. So what else has been going on on The New Way We Work? Yeah, so in 2022, we have covered a lot. Uh, we covered the new labor movement with uh, journalist and activist Kim Kelly. Um, the labor movement, I don't know if you've noticed, is kind of having a moment. Uh, 71% of people now support labor unions, which is like the highest it's been since the 60s. Um, we also covered why more people are freelancing, uh, things like how to make friends at work, and, you know, you know, kind of the big topics that everyone's thinking about, like what the future of the office should look like and, and how to look for a job after you've been laid off and kind of all of those things that are like in the news um, on a personal level. Like real friends or what work countries friends? can you what <laughs> countries questions. can you get a digital nomad visa from? <laughs> See, I love <laughs> I love how Amelia is like, asking real questions. I'm like, wait a minute, let's pause on this work friends thing for a minute. Are we no, tell me about, about work like, friends. Actual friends. <laughs> how or do you work make work friends, friends on Zoom? Some people feel like they need that clear separation between like their personal lives and their work lives. And so it's like, are we talking about office friends, like people that you're just cool with at the water cooler or like friends like BFF? I think both. And mm. I think like the power of and the like reason why and we've and we've done articles about this, right, of like why your boss should care if you have friends at work. Like it's not just like a nice to have. It makes it so people have a someone they can trust, they feel more, you know, they're going to stay at their job longer, like those sorts of things. But like really have, and having an ally, having like real relationships with the people you work with. I don't want my boss in my business like that. But Amelia, <laughs> go ahead and ask your astute question. <laughs> no, I was just saying, um, I was just thinking about the different countries you can get a digital nomad visa for. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty cool. Ah, that's awesome. That we have not explored. So I will, I will help our listeners <laughs> figure out how to get work visas in the, in the next season maybe <laughs> i know take themselves off to costa rica or barbados or something oh that's fantastic <laughs> okay so casey on to you um you've mm. had a big change in 2022 a uh, creative conversation has become creative control uh that your ev evolution of your show now focusing on the creator economy so what are some of the the biggest trends the biggest pieces of news from the creator economy that you've covered this year yeah, so this past season of the podcast, we've really focused on creators 
trying to find more equity in the creator economy because we all know the creator economy is it's really nothing new, but we haven't seen this much money, this much activity flowing into this space the way it has over the past year or so. It really started in 2020, which is like a big reason why we decided to shift our focus of the podcast because it's just been blowing up ever since the pandemic uh, locked everyone in their homes and people you know, turned on their cameras. And so really we wanted to focus on anytime there is a large amount of money and people moving into a space, the first thing that I always think of is like, where's the equity? Are people getting an even slice of the pie, really. And of course, we found out that's not it. And so some of the topics that we are exploring uh, on the podcast are, you know, how some creators, particularly marginalized creators, feel invisible or targeted by the algorithms of these platforms. You know, we spoke to, you know, trans creator who feel who was like locked out of her account for no for no apparent reason, adult workers who have always had like a long history of being pushed off of platforms, you know, like Black creators who have found themselves in situations where they can't really talk about Black things without being targeted by the algorithm. Like, these are things that have been they documented and shown, and it's been really interesting. And there, the other part about uh, finding equity in the creator economy is, like, money. Like, that's a huge thing, is that a lot of people have been trying to figure out how to make a full-time living. And so exploring the middle class, because there will always be that top percent of earners, but from what I've heard from creators, a lot of them are okay with not ever reaching the point of having hundreds of millions of followers and getting these million dollar brand deals. They just want to have a decent living. They just want to be in the middle class. And that's very, very hard to accomplish. And in one episode of the podcast, I talked to this Twitch streamer, Mitch Long, and he had a lot to say. It was probably one of my favorite interviews this past that this past season because he was very amped up about what Twitch should be doing, what they're not doing. And long story short, it's really they're they're not paying their streamers enough. So we have a clip of it that we'll play right now. This business is cyclical. The one thing that's not cyclical is rent, is insurance, is making sure your bills are paid, is keeping extra money in case something happens, right? And and when you're on a 1099, which this is a 1099, you're a contractor with Twitch. You are not a full-time. There's nothing guaranteed. They owe you nothing. That's another thing you have to understand. If they change the splits, or something happens, you get sick, you get COVID and you can't stream, you're not making any revenue. Hmm. You you, you have a little bit of subscription. So the diversification that you're talking about is so critical because if one lever falls, you still have all these different things. That's why like a creator will tell you, I'm doing YouTube, I'm doing merch, I'm doing products. You, You just have to get your hands in so many different varieties to create different revenue streams because this business is cyclical. It's really hard. It's really, really hard um, to make money on here. Oh my God, I love that. You know what's not cyclical? Rent. Like Exactly. Oh. And that's yeah. that's so interesting because that that ties really into, you know, a, a theme we had on the new way we work about people freelancing and, and people losing their jobs. That that advice that he gave of like, I'm on YouTube, I'm on this. Like it's we we talked about that, like diversify your portfolio. Don't put your all of your eggs in one basket. Like your employer doesn't you know, owe you anything. And it's even more so for, you know, as he said, they're 1099. There's no severance. There's no, yeah. Mm -hmm. The burnout for people is so real for content creators as well. I mean, there's just, there's no work hours. There's no off switch, right? Yeah. I was going to say the exact same thing. Like spreading yourself so thin is something that a lot of people have just, they're used to at this point. But, but I think what one thing that a lot of creators are talking about in increasing numbers is the burnout. Like what happens when you're spreading yourself across all these platforms and you you have merch that you're thinking about, you have, you know, the actual content that you need to produce, this, that, whatever. And really burnout has become this epidemic, honestly, a lot among creators and among everyone, but creators specifically. And I know that there's a lot that uh, people have, people are trying to alleviate that in some way in terms of, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that are, they're helping creators become production studios. Um, you know, it's, it's trying to alleviate some of that pressure of having to do these weekly uploads by like backlogging a bunch of videos. So that way you can take a break. You can't, or uploading your content as seasons. That's something that I spoke to Emma Chamberlain about uh, in the, in this, in um, earlier in the season as well. Just her her sort of prediction is that more creators will start uploading their content as season. So that way they can say, hey, you're going to get content from this month to this month. And for the summer, I'm off. I'm gone. Like, I, I, I am not going to be online. So it's been really interesting, uh, really digging into some of these meteor topics in the creator economy. And yeah, I've I've I have 
thoroughly enjoyed this this switch. I mean, creative creative conversation was a lot of fun, but I feel like with creative control, we've had a chance to really uh, uncover some interesting stories that hopefully resonate <laughs> that hopefully will you know make some change because i think i'm a big advocate for especially when it comes to marginalized voices of just giving them a little bit of a platform you know it's like not not to disparage fast company we're great publication but you know just something something to kind of boost these stories and bring more attention to it but that is enough about me let's focus oh, see, on i was gonna Amelia. i was, I was nope. going to ask you multiple <laughs> no. more things about creative control fine you got fine. one one fine. more thing <laughs> well i was gonna well i was gonna say about the payment uh you know mm. we, you worked with harris poll this year to to mm-hmm. kind of pull people to find out how much they are willing to pay the creators that they love spoiler alert it's not that much what are the going rates casey what are they yeah, so this was an episode that I was really in one of our brainstorming meetings. I was curious because we always hear about that threshold that audiences are willing to pay for like Netflix and Hulu and things like that. And I was thinking, well, what's that threshold for subscription based social media platforms like Patreon or Substack or OnlyFans? And so we conducted a Harris poll and we found that 73 percent of people said they were scri- they're subscribed to mainstream services like Netflix and HBO. But only 20 percent said they were subscribed to creator focused platforms like Twitch, Patreon and Substack. And also in the past year, more than 50 percent of people canceled a paid subscription to creator platforms with 42 percent saying that they They'd rather spend their money on something else and 41% saying that there just wasn't enough content to justify a subscription. So it kind of goes back to what I'm saying of like there, a lot of creators kind of get in this trap of they'll, they get a following, but then it's really hard to feed that beast. It's really hard to produce content at the level of say like, a Netflix is producing content because Netflix has, you know, I mean, Netflix, they've, they've, they've seen better days this past year, but they were still talking about this huge organization. And I think people feel this in their minds are like, oh, why can't this creator produce as much content as I'm getting from like a Netflix or an HBO? And so like, oh, you're not doing it. I'm going to, it's not worth paying for it. And also it's what we journalists kind of face with like paywalls. Like once you, once audiences are so used to getting something for free, like how do you make them pay for it? Like, how do you make that content like good enough to say like, hey, this warrants however much money I'm charging for it. So it's it's interesting that, um, and I in that episode, and I encourage everyone to check it out because I interviewed a- Anthony Infoldano, who it works at Fandom, which is this big, the internet's like largest site for fandoms, but they do their own state of streaming report. So it was really interesting to compare and contrast like their findings in terms of like, you know, more mainstream uh, on-demand content and whatnot versus more creator focused content. So yeah, it's, uh, I, I was actually a little bit surprised that people were not willing to pay for creators that they love, but I don't know. I think maybe that number will increase in the coming years as more creators ramp up their content, but who knows? Who knows? But it really, that was like the biggest takeaway that there just wasn't enough content to really justify paying for a subscription. So I don't know. I think these brand deals are also kind of difficult, right? If Mm. your favorite content creator then has a big brand deal with a sponsor that you don't feel like you align with, it all becomes kind of murky. Yeah, that is true. And honestly, that is a huge, that's like the biggest revenue driver still for creators are those brand deals. And so figuring out how to I mean, this is something, honestly, that platforms are trying to figure out as well. I mean, like trying to break free of advertising dollars and really trying to like get that direct payment from consumers. Like, that's huge. And, you know, that's something that that we talk about in the Twitch episode as well. I mean, you heard Mitch kind of go on his, on his rant about payments and, you know, Twitch changed their revenue splits. And so they're taking, they're taking more, they're basically taking more money from direct subscriptions. So you would think more of that would go to the streamers you know this is not this is not this is not pre-roll ad revenue this is like direct subscription revenue and that's not the case so it's really interesting and i think you know going into the ne- like the next season we definitely want to dig deeper into all these topics and um yeah so i i i've been really enjoying this switch um like i said i loved creative conversation but digging into these 
the meteor stories has been a lot of fun. But uh, I want to ask you, Amelia, because as the newest member of the Fast Company podcast family, welcome, Jombo. We love having you here. <laughs> um, what have been some of your favorite moments from world changing ideas this past season? Because, you know, as you mentioned, you, you're you very optimistic. You had a lot of positive stuff to say at the beginning of this. Oh, guys, episode. it's been so joyful. This podcast has been so joyful. <laughs> <laughs> Make me happy, Amelia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I want to note that she's covering like climate change, like one of the like most depressing topics there could possibly be, but you you've managed to put a a hopeful spin on it. Yeah, you're you're so right, Kate. It's not sunshine and rainbows all the time. This is correct. But I mean, it, it has been a pretty international year for world changing ideas. We've traveled to loads of fun places. We've got stories from South Korea, the Netherlands. Germany, LA, we've been all over the place. Some of my favorite big ideas have been around cellular ag- ag- cellular agriculture, which is growing real meat in a lab, just using some animal cells, no animals harmed in the process. It's all very futuristic. We heard from a company called Brave Robot, which is using this technique, precision fermentation to make ice cream, brewing up milk proteins, sort of in a big vat like beer, so they don't need cows. I mean, this is just going to transform the food we eat. We chatted with some NASA scientists about how we could soon be getting our electricity from a giant solar farm in outer space. It's it's all pretty sci-fi. And we got stuck into a few world-changing ideas around sanitation. Um, I heard about some off-grid toilets of the future, which sounds kind of gross, but apparently people are fascinated by poop. Uh, we we looked at some really futuristic toilets, which aren't actually connected to sewers. They run on electricity and they spontaneously combust your poop underwater to make these little bricks called feces cakes. I mean, mm. that, was, that was pretty wild. <laughs> We've got a little quote here from uh, Professor Shannon Yee, who is taking on uh, Thomas Crapper in the Toilet Hall of Fame. <laughs> People are saying in the future, you might be saying, oh, I need to take a yee instead of take a pee. Anyway, so listen listen to Dr. Yee here. It has a front end unit, which looks just like a regular toilet. So that would look exactly the same in your bathroom. And that unit kind of just looks like a giant box. It's like a, a washing machine. We actually elevate the feces in pressure and temperature. So we heat them up and we pressurize them and we enter into this phase of matter known as a supercritical fluid where the feces spontaneously combust underwater. It's a pretty unique way of doing that is that we can actually burn feces underwater. How? I liked watching the evolution of of Casey's (laughs) facial expressions while listening to that. Like, huh? Hmm? I was ah. like, spontaneously combust underwater already has me, you know, I'm like, oh, huh? but then spontaneously combusting feces underwater. Can you not do that out of water? What? Like, what is, what's, what's the... I know. What? And another thing to tell you guys about this toilet is it is so futuristic. It uses hardly any water and it uses the water from your pee to flush the loo. I mean, wild. (laughs) So purifies it and uses it to flush the loo. I want to live in a world where I have one of those. And maybe, you know, it it warms your butt on the toilet seat as well. Who knows? Oh, I don't want that. (laughs) I don't mind a cold toilet seat, to be honest. Because I feel like a warm toilet seat, I just... Like like someone's been there. (laughs) Someone's been there. (laughs) I know, maybe that's a bit creepy. I I also got to visit South Korea's Toilet Museum, which was an experience. So I I can talk to you for so long about the history of toilets, but maybe you want to go to the episode for that. I what? bet you're a, a riot at parties, Amelia. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> Everyone's favorite guest at the party. I can see why you feel so hopeful, like hearing all of these, these uh, amazing innovations that people are coming up with. You know, it's like, you know, we were talking about how depressing the news is, but it's like somebody has figured out how to spontaneously combust poop. Someone has figured out how to make ice cream without cows. Like th- that there are these people in the world that are coming up with these amazing ideas. It is great. And we've had some awesome guests as well. So we spoke to the global chief heat officer. I mean, that is now a job you can have. She's in charge of dealing with extreme heat and rising temperatures around the world. Some of the Global South's most high profile youth activists who are campaigning for environmental change. And they had some pretty interesting things to say about how to make your story memorable, to stick with people if you're trying to change people's behavior. 
And um, yeah, we've got some some pretty wild futuristic things coming up as well. Mm, I can't wait. And I'm curious, you know, knowing that you are in this space and you're thinking about it a lot, where is there room for innovation? Like where, I guess, like what's a problem that you feel like someone has yet to really tackle in an innovative way? Yeah, there's... I mean, there is a lot of those. Yeah. What's your top <laughs> I one? Think there's, yeah, I mean, there's space for innovation everywhere. So I think for me, it's really plastic. Like wow. plastic trash is just, I mean, that really, really gets me depressed because you think you're dealing with plastic trash and then we've got the microplastics and just the economy is not supporting recycling. You know, when it's cheaper to make single-use plastic, people are not going to do things that are against their financial interest and that go against the economy. So I, I really feel strongly that kind of governments and regulation and companies need to be, you know, held to account. I mean, there are people who are making amazing plastic alternatives, but when it's so expensive, I, that's never going to catch on. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as you were saying, people need to pay bills. Yeah. And isn't it something like sev only like seven or eight percent of plastic actually gets recycled? There's some dismal number like that where it's, it's like really dismal. people think they're doing the right thing, but it's there's so much plastic that cannot be recycled that people think that they can be. Like I remember when I found out that the the plastic container and deodorants, like the majority of those can't be recycled. And that's what made no. me switch to a lot. And one thing that kind of gives me a little bit of hope, a little bit, is some of these larger companies are catching wise. Like for example, Dove. That's the deodorant I use. They now have a metal container that you can buy refillable deodorant in. And that even that little cartridge has way less plastic. Yeah. So I kind of feel like there's a lot of smaller companies that have been doing these, doing like thinking in a more sustainable way. And it's taken so long for these larger companies to catch wise. And I think that that's really where you're going to see some significant movement. Like it's just... Anyway, yeah. So plastic, that's that that's a big one for sure. I mean, plastic is just in everything. And you think you're making some headway and then you wash your clothes and there's microplastics and, you know, that's it for the dolphins. I read just recently that a really horrifying thing that's going to stick with me forever, and now it can stick with you, Please is share. that we <laughs> ingest about a credit card's worth of microplastics a week. That is, yeah. Through our, like, drinking, air, food. We're just consuming we must be half made of plastic by right now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You're like, and that's why you'll live forever because i'm 90 percent plastic at this point <laughs> i am i'm getting this like filter water bottle for christmas i've got so paranoid about the microplastics you know and it's gonna filter everything out for me and that will be that unless the filter <laughs> has plastic in it it is probably made of plastic <laughs> perma crisis it's gone full circle we're back at a perma that crisis, is perma crisis. Oh plastic my God. equals perma perma crisis <sighs> anyway so, I can't so really look cover we, we that took that we took your we took your optimism and we found a way amelia Casey and I, know, I have I know. broken it. <laughs> but here's the thing. I think just I th breaking you down. <laughs> I think we can pull out of this nosedive by talking about new year's resolutions. I'm the most unqualified pilot for this <laughs> i'm usually the one that's like driving us down but we're going to share our personal new year's resolutions in a minute but first fast company has written extensively on tips for making new year's resolutions and kate you've collected some of your favorites so please share with the class yes yeah, so uh, new year's resolutions uh is a is a big popular topic for us at fast company in january you know we we slice it different ways every year and it's always really popular i get it like you you want to feel hope and like a chance to like start anew in the new year. Well, I will bring you down first before I bring you up and tell you that only 8% of people follow through on the goals that they set in January, which means 92% of people who set New Year's resolutions don't keep them. But in order to try to be in that 8%, here are a couple tips, easy-ish things to do. So the biggest one is to set small goals throughout the year instead of doing like a sweeping attempt at reforms in January and saying like, I am going to run a marathon and then you don't run a marathon to kind of break it into measurable improvements, things that you can actually kind of achieve and like you maintain that progress and you can check that smaller bit of the goal off your list and you feel that progress towards like keeping the momentum towards the, the bigger goal. Uh, my next tip is to remind yourself why you want to make the change in the first place. I think a lot of people make New Year's resolutions that are like, I want to be a better person. I want to do these things that I think I should do. But if you don't have a reason to do it, you're most likely not going to do it. And so like some are really deeply personal, like uh, people who 
who decide they want to quit smoking because they they want to stay alive for their children or they want to like or even on a smaller note like they want to play softball and not get winded or something like but like a, a reason why you're doing it that's beyond just like I think I should do this or it sounds like a a, a good thing to do because who needs a reason to be a good person yeah. <laughs> right. But I mean, like, but like something so vague, you know, of like, oh, right. I'm going to do this thing. But like, do you actually want to do that or you think you just should do that? So you're telling me I don't need to be a better person. No. I love that. Thank you. That's continue with your tips. No, that's fine. That's, what I'm, that's what I'm taking away from what you just said. I have carte blanche to be trash. So thank you, Kate. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, and then <laughs> my last tip is to create a plan for for dealing with like setbacks because inevitably you are going to like miss a day if your New Year's resolution is to run every day. Um, and we have a, an author, Gretchen Rubin, who's written about this for us before. And she's called it the what the hell phenomenon, where like a minor, minor stumble becomes like a major fall. And you're like, oh, well, I can't do this anymore. So now I'm just not going to do it at all. And so it's kind of building that crushing pain of failure. Like, oh, yeah. I didn't I didn't follow through. So I guess I've broken my New Year's resolution is like to plan that that's going to happen and to have a plan that like when that happens, I'm going to still then, you know, reset and go back to it. So it's, it's you know, all of these kind of boil down to like, don't make yourself a big promise that you can't keep on January 1st and, and kind of like look at it in smaller bits. That's fair. So what's your New Year's resolution, Kate? Uh, well, in that vein, um, I will have really uh, cheesy slash easy ones. One, cheesy and easy, baby. Cheesy and yeah. easy. That's the Kate That's Davis me right way. now. This yellow, I'm cheesy <laughs> and I'm easy. Ow. Anyway, it's the, it's the <laughs> Kate Davis 2023 brand. So I have found success in the past with doing things in small doses. Um, I have, you know, had wanted to write a novel for a long time, but like writing a novel is a big lofty goal. So I instead said, I'm going to write for 20 minutes every night. And I kept that up for a year. So um, I've been taking tap dance for a while and I'm still in the beginner class. And so my goal is to get to intermediate class and I'm going to do that by tap dancing for 10 minutes every day. That's so cool. <laughs> okay, so wait, when's the recital? Oh, gee, that, yeah. That is what I need to know. <laughs> I want to see videos. That is fantastic. Oh, I love that. Oh, <laughs> see, a little tap dancer. Little, um, little tap. Amelia, what about tapping you? my troubles away. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Amelia, what are your news resolutions? So I've got two. Okay. One is easy and one is a bit less easy. So the first one is I want to give more money to charity because I see so many of these amazing organizations doing stuff on the ground. And then you kind of forget about it or you think, you know, you give once and then you sort of forget about it. And I think, okay, solution to this, just set up some automated payments. You know, I'm thinking of it like I just want to buy those charities like a coffee every month, $5, have one less coffee a month and set up some auto payments so I can't fail. Mm. How good is that? Smart. <laughs> <laughs> that's great advice because that's and I think that's what a lot of charities, you know, suggest people to do. And I've done that with a couple of the the charities that I donate to, the monthly automated thing. So it's just there and you totally forget about it and it's part of your budget and you don't, it doesn't hurt. You know, it's like, yeah. 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 It's So that's a good one. My slightly harder one, I've been inspired by our producer Avery and I want to compost stuff. Mm. You know, we are having a soil crisis right now, according to the UN. So <laughs> we need to be composting to save the soil. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to get a, a worm bin for Christmas and feed it my coffee grounds. Nice. I love that. I mean, and your I, food waste. Apparently, it's quite easy to do. I'll let you know. Yeah, let me know. Because you need like a bin that closes so you don't have this like smelly mm. stuff in your kitchen, but you can bury it in the garden and then you feed your worms. I'm a bit worried the birds will eat these worms, but I'm ex out of this because I live in Brooklyn. I don't have a garden. <laughs> um, but. I have been looking into, there's a company, I can't remember the name of it, but they make like a, a tabletop compost bin that's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the smell, anything like that. And I'm, but they're expensive. They're really yeah. expensive. And I'm like, I... Barrier to entry. It's bad. Yeah, that's that's an issue that I feel like a lot of cities need to look into because I it's very hard to get a compost bin because, you know, you have the recycling yes. bin, your trash bin. It's actually kind of hard. Like some fancier neighborhoods new york city them. had a composting tried to start a composting program several years ago and they delivered little compost bins to all of the apartments and we got one Ooh. and our landlord told us not to do it because he said 
will get fined. People won't separate it correctly. And I think the city, I don't know why, but I think the city scrapped the program in part because mm. it, you know. I'm going to look into this for you, Kate. Thank you. Please do. And I'll find your nomad visa and you find out why <laughs> New York City <laughs> yes. scrapped their composting. Why are we not composting? Seriously. Yeah. No, that's a, really, that's a really good resolution. I like that. Thanks, guys. Uh, I guess. All right, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> in doing a full... 180 from what you suggested of doing something small. I, it, you know, it's not even <laughs> You're that like, I listened to your tips and I'm not doing I'm like, any uh-huh, of them. Uh-huh, uh-huh, got it. <laughs> Love it. Anyway, though. 92% <laughs> fail. Go ahead. No, but here's my He's going okay. against the grain. So I want to do at least one creative thing a day for the next year. And when I say creative thing, I mean, it can be a sketch. It can be a short, it can be like a really short story. It can be a poem. It can be a recipe that I make up. I feel like I want to free myself of this idea that, you know, the muses have to strike me in order mm-hmm. to do something. Like kind of to your point, Kate, of writing a novel. I mean, it's really, I get in my head a lot for the projects that I want to do because I feel like, oh, you know, like I, I'm just going to wait until I feel inspired. No, I want to make a schedule. I want to like have more discipline. But also, I want to free myself of the idea that something has to be perfect for it to be, for it to exist. Yeah, you have to make a lot of, like, crappy, you have, to, I mean, my novel's really bad. Like, yeah. you have to, like, you <laughs> Kate, don't say that. You have to, you have to produce <laughs> a lot. I don't believe it. It is. But you have to, there's, a, maybe there's a couple gems in there, but that's kind of the right. point, right? That's the is thing. you have to create a lot of crap. Right. No pun intended with the the toilet. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you everyone have loves to, crap. But you have to make a lot of bad exactly. things to get some good things. And so I think that's a great resolution. And that's kind of along the lines of writing for 20 minutes a day or mm-hmm. tap dancing for 10 minutes a day. Right. Like if you make a date with your creativity of just like, I'm going to sit down and it's going to be a stick person that I draw today, but at least I did something. It's just doing something with your right. hands, isn't it? Like, yeah, I feel exactly. like I went all today and I literally just typed on my computer. Like, I did nothing. Maybe I stroked the dog. That's You know, thing. it was like <laughs> That's doing something thing. with your hands. I know. And for me, it's like, you know, anybody who, all my friends know that I'm doing, I'm making soap. I make my own lotion. I make candles. I bake bread. I do all of these things. But I just feel like I want to start just documenting them a little bit. I want to start just making more time for these things, really. And so I'm just, I'm holding myself accountable. I'm making this declaration that I want to do at least one creative thing like a day for a year. And you have 365 things. There you go. Like, I'm, Mm. I'm, and honestly, I feel the more I think about it, the more excited I am about it. And I don't feel, I don't feel daunted by it. So that's how I know that I may, I may get this done. Do you have a creativity (laughs) buddy to keep you accountable? I'm I'm recruiting them. I'm recruiting them. Yes. No, actually I am. Yeah. That's another really good tip that we've covered a lot is is yeah, having somebody that that holds you accountable or holding yourself accountable by saying it publicly on a podcast, yes. by posting it somewhere, <laughs> by like saying it in a way that, you know that like somebody can follow up with you and like are you doing it? Yeah. I'm not kidding. Just last night I was like scripting out because I'm I'm gonna make a video and post it on Instagram. And I do not post on Instagram, but I feel like if I make this very public declaration that that will light a fire <laughs> under me to do it. Are you going to document all of the things and post all of the things? My plan is that if if I make something that's actually great and I really like it, then yeah, I'll share it. But like mostly it's just gonna be me. So like in March, you know, day whatever, like if I if I do something really cool, I'll be like, hey, here's this. Yeah. But I think at the end of it, I'm going to keep track of it. And I think it'd be a really cool thing at the end of a year just to say, like, here's this my 365 creative, like creative things that I've done. So I'm excited. Yeah, show us the failures too. I love a bit of. Oh, there's going to, it's going to be like 98% failure. Yeah, um, like my novel is 98% bad. Yeah, exactly. We can all relate. <laughs> I scroll on TikTok and I see people like, oh, this is how you draw this or this is how you paint this. Here's like this painting technique. And I'm like, oh, I want to try that. And so actually, again, last night I scripted my little declaration out. And I also went through my TikTok and started pulling all my inspirations because I want to just do these things. So. Just being more creative and, like I said, doing one creative thing a day for a year. Well, in December 2023, we can come back here and and see. And I'll have a a very long slideshow. (laughs) See if you fit in the 92% or the 8% of people who kept or did not keep their resolutions. You can then write a book about what you learned from that year. 
There you go. I'm just telling you. This is just, and the Kate is going to be you and me, bestseller. Number <laughs> yep. one, number two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, yeah. which one am I? <laughs> number one, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. But this, oh, this has been fun, everyone. <laughs> I appreciate it. And, you know, that's going to do it for this episode. I mean, we will be back in the new year with more great podcast episodes for all you listeners out there. But before we go, we asked some of our colleagues at Fast Company to record their resolutions as well as some of their family's resolutions. So we'll leave you with those. But thanks for listening this past year. And thanks to everyone at Fast Company who makes each of our shows possible. We could not do without you, literally. Like so. very much so could not <laughs> do it without you. Oh, thanks, thank guys. you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you hardworking gnomes and elves. <laughs> the Fast Company factory. So happy holidays, everyone, and happy new year. My new year's resolution is to enter and win a speed puzzling competition. So good. My resolution is to find more balance in my life. Get more involved in animal conservation. Stop wasting so much time on the internet. My resolution is to read more and be on TikTok less. Read more and use Twitter less. I'm going to make a list of 23 hard things that I want to do in 2023. To do more of the things that are difficult in the moment, but pay off in the long run. I love that. I think that's great. Save more money and prioritize work-life balance. My New Year's resolution is to go to the dentist. My New Year's resolution is not to go to the dentist. I'm a little crunchy. This year I really want to get away from plastic, so I'm going to get plastic out of my bathroom. And I like chip the tooth a little bit. (laughs) My New Year's resolution is to drink less alcohol and sleep more. (laughs) So I need to go, but I don't want to go. I want to sign up for a dance class. I'm going to the dentist for the first time in like five years tomorrow, everyone. I... fuck. hit save draft just a little bit more. Sometimes I think when I respond to something really quickly, it creates a sense of urgency. I do not make New Year's resolutions simply because it's better to goal set. And when you set goals, they're smaller and easier to achieve rather than setting grandiose resolutions that you fail. Spoken like a true work life. (laughs) Learn how to French braid hair. To do something creative, like singing. To improve upon my writing. Writing music. And write more cards to people. Write and possibly finish a fucking script. 30 minutes of exercise. Also to keep approving upon my driving. This one's probably the toughest and most unlikely given my age, but learn how to do a cartwheel. And no, I did not pursue cryptocurrency. <laughs>